How you doing? It's Zach Allen. So, you know, I've been loving this hack motion wrist sensor. We've done a couple videos on it already, but, you know, just learning so much information and just clarifying things that are really happening in the golf swing. Okay. So what I want to kind of talk about today is some stuff that'll really help you get control over what your hands and wrists are doing. Right. And more specifically, if you notice this blue box here, we're going to talk a little bit of, you know, they call it ulnar and radial deviation. It just means hinge up, right? It goes to a positive number and unhinge downward, right? And how much players do that? When it goes downward, it goes to a negative number. And over here, we have some wrist graphs, and we're kind of once again using this wrist graph of Tiger Woods. He is the dotted line, and this was a swing that I just took here. I am the solid line. And basically what that's measuring, right, is kind of that age old question is, should I early hinge my wrist? How much do I hinge my wrist when I get to the top? Do I not hinge my wrist at all? Do I just let the weight of the club hinge my wrist? What exactly are these players doing? And it's cool as you swing along with him on hack motion and you kind of watch me do it in person, I think it's going to give you a better idea of what you should be doing with your wrist. And the answer as I'm swinging along with him and getting students to kind of get a feel of what really good hands feel like. This is him hitting a seven iron, right? And if you watch his golf swing, right, that's what's kind of misleading is you watch it and it makes you think that, oh, he's hinging his wrist about this much and I think I'm probably doing the same. He's hinging them a lot less than probably what you perceive or what you, what you would uh, look at on, on a camera view, okay? So what we're talking about here is at address, you notice kind of the blue, is it a negative 20 something, right? And as he goes along in the backswing, his wrists are obviously gonna start to hinge some, but he's not doing it much. So I did a slow swing there with pretty steady wrist. I'm still actually hinging it that much earlier and that much more than him on that particular swing. And let me kind of just give you a feel like, imagine you just watch my practice swing here. This is what I would normally feel, right? This would be my normal practice swing if I wasn't thinking about this at all. I would probably get up there somewhere more like this, which to me would feel like a nice full wrist hinge at the top. Watch this one. So you notice how much higher that line got. That's when I started hinging from a dress and then this is the top of backswing. And then even what happened there is I started down, my wrist kept hinging on the way down, which is not something that his wrists do. You notice how he does not get up to the top as high as I did. And then as he gets to the top of backswing, it stays level to go slightly downward. Mine actually went up more. And I can definitely feel when I did that swing, as I kind of let the club kind of droop or hinge more at the top, that makes it really unhinge more down at the bottom. And I see that with a lot of players, especially when you're trying to get more power or you've got like a long driver swing, we really start to let our wrist kind of droop at the top and hinge. And then as we start down, there's gonna be this big unhinging down at the bottom that we've got to deal with. And that gives us face control, loft control, contact, low point, a lot of issues that arise um, that are tough to consistently repeat, right? As far as those impact conditions, right? We want those to be as predictable as possible. So what I'm trying to let you know is one of the best ways that you can kind of do that better is don't swing the club so much from your wrist on your backswing. I'm kind of using my bigger muscles to transport the club. And then from there, even as I go to the top, I'm gonna to feel like my wrists stay pretty steady. They're not tense, they're not, you know, I'm not death gripping the club, but my wrists just feel very quiet. So I think you would agree that was a fairly wristless calm backswing. So that's better. That's definitely much better, right? It's a little bit higher than his. I don't have that, that peak again after the top where the club was down cocking on the way down. And the big reason why is whatever this height is at the top of backswing or near it, you've got to unhinge all the way down to impact. So usually the farther that timing is because you hinged more, you've got to unhinge more. And that's where all the um, randomness of impact can start to occur, okay? So what I would have you try, right, especially if you're experiencing some inconsistencies with your ball striking, is try to be more stable and steady in your wrist in terms of not breaking and hinging them as much, right? I know there's some great players that had 
some really long swings with a lot of wrist cock at the top, like Bubba Watson, Phil Mickelson, John Daly, right? And they obviously hit the ball really far too because they've got this longer wind up and, and really full wrist set at the top. But think about the talent level that we're talking about, right? Those might be actually the three most talented people I would probably name as far as just um, you know, innate talent that they were just you know, given with at birth is Mickelson, Bubba Watson, and John Daly. For your average folk, right? Me, you, and everybody else, it's probably better to be a little more steady as we swing the club. And what's cool about that, as you do less from here, less of this, right? Which causes a lot of breakdown and overswing, our body starts to do more because we're not swinging the club from here, right? We could do a lot of that and I'm getting a lot of whip at the bottom. It feels powerful, but my wrists are just going off the charts there. It looks more like a roller coaster or Mount Everest as far as how big that peak looks. That's just more wrist hinge, excessive wrist hinge, down cock, and then a very long way to go to go from here down to impact. And that happens in about 0.15 seconds. That's got to occur from there to there. So it's just too much, too much timing. So take a couple practice swings and just feel the conditions that you have your wrist in. You're going to feel like they just kind of stay like that. I call it kind of a wristless feeling or a wristless swing. And then to the top, that's where you want to really be careful because back here, stuff starts to happen that we cannot see or feel, right? As the weight of the club starts to get on this side of our body, try to control your trail arm and control your wrist conditions to where it stops a little, what, what, might, what might feel shorter, a little wider, a little firmer. And then you notice as I do it, it all stops at the same time. I'm not letting it run off or run on as I get to the top. So you take a couple practice swings like that. And I can feel already the club just striking the ground and going through the turf feels way more square and stable, right? Rather than the, the big one where I can feel the club really whipping past me. So that's a, that's a pretty darn good wrist graph. I'm not the goat there, obviously, but I got as high as him. I, I did it a little earlier, which is fine. He did it a little bit later, but we got to the same peak height there. That's actually very good, very good. So when you go out to hit, maybe at first, don't hit it full distance or full speed. You could have a camera running just to kind of monitor what you see. Because when I work with people in person, they would swear that they're not hinging their wrist and then you'll still see it's hinging some. So to have a little feedback from a camera or a friend of just really feeling, okay, my wrists are not changing from here to the top. All I'm really doing is just carrying the club, transporting it with my body motion, but I'm not swinging it from here very much, okay? And then on the way through, we get that benefit of that same sensation on the way through. You notice how my arc looks long and wide and extended. And then that gets my whole right side, right shoulder through the ball a little bit more cohesively. Once we start doing this, you know coming down, the opposite, there's going to be a lot of that as that club goes whipping past us, right? But that's a lot of hand speed or what I call flash speed. It's not big muscle, heavy hit, stable wrist, you know, the type of stuff that usually produces more consistency under pressure. All right, so I hope that helps you out. We obviously have some links if you're interested in getting a hack motion yourself. I absolutely love the thing. It takes a little bit of learning to get used to, but it is really revealing just a lot of things that I've had even questions for, for years about, and I've been teaching for 30 years. So it really gets you to feel what these great players are actually doing, not what it looks like they're doing on video. All right, I will see you next time around. Thanks for watching. If you'd like to permanently eliminate your slice, add 20 or more yards to your drives, and make consistently flush contact swing after swing, then I got just the thing for you. I'm about to show you a method that will fix your swing fast before you reach the bottom of your next bucket of range balls. In fact, we often see a huge improvement on the very first swing. Since I don't have time in this short video, I put together a three-part web class where I show you the exact process, nothing held back. I call it the one swing fix, and you can get the entire thing free of charge by clicking the link right here. The training series isn't available anywhere else, so go ahead, click the link right now, and I'll see you on the other side.